Good morning. My name is Dr. Kenneth E. Jones, and I serve as the interim provost and vice president for academic affairs at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. And I want to say welcome to everyone to this um, series, second in a series of um, second series, if you will, for the project um, engine for art democracy and justice, uh, sponsored by uh, Dr. Magna Campos Pons, uh, the Cornelius Vanderbilt Endowed Chair of Fine Arts and Artists at uh, Vanderbilt University. We are so happy to have you with us this morning uh, for this excellent conversation uh, that will be addressing redefining monuments, a very timely um, subject matter, something that we all are going to gain a great deal of information and really part of a great conversation. And we are so happy here at Fisk University to be sponsoring along with Vanderbilt University and also very proud of our moderator today, who is Professor Jamal Sheets uh, here at Fisk University. So again, we are welcoming you to this great presentation. We know that you're going to enjoy every moment of it. And thank you for your time and for your interest. Welcome everyone. I am joining you and invite you to stay with us for the next hour and a half. Uh, my name is Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, and I am the founder and creator of Engine for Art, Democracy, and Justice. And in a time of despair, in a time of urgency, in a time when the moral structure of a society seems breaking apart, what an artist with consciousness, what an artist that is observing that is a bare witness of everyday life does. How an artist who dream and with life and ideas construct the textuality of the everyday language that they are trying to inscribe does in a moment in which the war and the moral compass of it seems out of tune. Yesterday, was our first debate in America. And we hear our president refuse to condemn white supremacy. He reminding us that the struggle and the fight that our ancestor who I called for help today is not completed. We found ourselves again and again slapping the face with the refusal to accept our humanity, our value, our capacity, our most fundamental human right to be breathing, to be alive, to be together, to have the opportunity to dream not only for us, but for our descendants, a better future. I reaching out to you this morning from the grounds of Vanderbilt an institution built with the labor of our ancestor line and an institution that today is taking steps to just rectify and prove that the fight for justice is embraced by many is possible. My own appointment is a testimony of that. I am talking to you for a land that was decimated and violated one and many times of this locals and original inhabitants. The indigenous population of these small biles and mountains of Tennessee, to then I pray and to then I pay with EADJ honor and acknowledge the value of their life and the energy that they left for us in this universe. I started my first introduction talking about gratitude, breathing, gathering, building, and love. Those five pillars will stay with us through this entire program. In our first episode, my dear friend 
and a warrior of the art and of justice, Carly may win as us. What is the skies that always are the artists who need to start this conversation? What we do, because we must, because we have moral urgency, because we know that artists are the one that write down the true history of our own human outcoming from the beginning and we will keep doing that for the rest of our present existence. I welcome every one of you. I thank all of our partners institution. I am proud that we are all today highlighting Fisk University, the first black college built in this ground and this region of Tennessee, 1866, few months after the end of the civil war and a few months after the end of the, uh, the establishment of the proclamation of emancipation. I really share the opportunity to call a sister institute, our partnership with Fisk. That is a gesture in the name of justice and in the name of democracy. It was a fifth university, the artists like us today is starting to fight for the idea of creating better opportunity for themselves and others. Du Bois did that, 1988, when he started fighting to build what is today the Van Beck Tech Gallery. The Jubilee Singers Group toured the world finding money to support the opportunity that other Black kids could go to Fisk and get the education needed. EADJ is only doing today the continuation of the work that those extraordinary previous Black Americans show us the way and show us the path. We are not doing anything new. We are just continuing a fight that is not done yet. To every one of our speakers today, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming with, for, with us from every part of the corner of the planetary south to talk about Monument Part 2. To our sponsor, thank you. And I want to pass the microphone now to our fantastic program curator, Marina Fokiris, to introduce to you the program. To our ancestor, light for this conversation and gratitude. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thank you for joining us from everywhere in the world. Hey, well, it's hard to take on after Provost Jones and Magda Campos Pons, but I'll do my best. It's a huge honor at the same time. My immense gratitude goes to Maria Magdalena Campos Pons for making us part of her vision and giving us the chance to work together on the challenging and gratifying path that brings us here today. Here, in the known place of a cloud, broadcasting from the EADJ platform and the Vanderbilt University in Nashville, while hoping for more art, more democracy, more justice across the planet and beyond that. My main gratitude goes to everyone that Magda thanked previously and all these people that are work behind the scenes right now with us, because without whom we wouldn't be here today. As for what we are about to experience, the thematic focus and the structure of this program is, informs, is informed as much as from our collective everydayness, all of us, viewers included, within these challenging times, as also from our uh, participating um, guests whose knowledge and practice has been guiding us for a long time now, much beyond the time frame of the webinar, and has been inspiring us to put a program as such together. We give you all thanks. Difficulties in breathing due to murder and pandemic at the same time. Difficulties in accepting the injustice towards each other. Difficulties to imagine a truly democratic space open to multiple viewpoints and perspectives. Difficulties, difficulties, difficulties call for an immediate restorative action. That's now it's needed more than ever. And here we are addressing the living in common in the precarious South. Living in common and not common living, as per the distinction that French uh, philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy makes, referring to togetherness that allows not only polyphony, but also reconciled contradictions to coexist within equality and respect. 
how can we redefine the way our differences brings us together and celebrate them as Audre Lorde, American writer and civil rights activist suggests? How can we fight the ultra-right authoritarian nationalist governmental morphologies that destroy our world? How can we form a truly democratic space within the arts and open up to an unexpected, an unexpected dialogue among neighborhoods, cities, regions, people, descender geographies and approaches? How to live together? This is the essential question. It's time to repair our coexistence before it's really too late. And with this, I'm leaving you to uh, Jamal Sitz, uh, artist and professor of Fisk University and moderator of this panel, and also to the words and ideas of our panel, all the new friends, some dear colleagues from Documenta 14's radical community that was saved by Adam Shimchik some years ago. Jamal, thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Magda. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and so excited to begin to kind of talk about this idea of redefining monuments. But the first thing I want to do is introduce our panelists. I'm, I'm, uh, introduce our panelists. So I'm going to start with Ibrahim Mahumama. Uh, he's an artist, author, educator. He was listed as one of the most influential Africans last year. His work has been widely exhibited and collected. Uh, he was included in the 19th, in the 56th, 57th, and 58th Venice Biennale, as well as Document 14. Uh, welcome, Ibrahim. The next person I would like to introduce is Caroline Randall Williams. She is an award-winning uh, poet, author, cookbook author, activist, intellectual, performance artist, and scholar. And most recently, she had been featured in on uh, MSNBC, amongst many other places. The next person that I'm excited to introduce is Bonaventure. He is a contemporary art curator, writer, founding director of Savvy Contemporary, editor of Savvy's Journal, which is an independent, um, excuse me, uh, uh, Savvy's Journal, which looks at critical issues uh, in contemporary art with a critical voice, looking at the African diaspora. And he most recently curated an exhibition in Vienna of Ulu Aguibe's work. Last, I'm going to introduce the moderator who you will hear at the end, Jane Landers. She is a Gertrude Conway Brennan Professor of History. She specializes in colonial Latin American and, and the Atlantic world. Um, and so that is the introduction for our panelists. Um, I would like to move to speaker view, not speaker view, but where we can see everyone. And so, it, and so I'm gonna to begin to one, thank everybody again, but also to think about what we discussed last week. Carrie Mae Weems raised these ideas or these, or these notions of the location of monuments. Uh, she talked about monuments being memory or the context of memory. She talked about, and Magda alluded to, her, to it earlier, this idea of supremacy or this male dominance power. And she talked about this idea of memory being attached to, to the location and being attached to the reflection of architecture and who built that architecture. And so with that, and thinking about the context that they provided last week, the first thing I would like to explore is for us to really begin to define what a monument is. And so I'm going to open it up and, I, and, and just to build the framework for the conversation, open it up to the panel to see what you view, what is a monument? How can we define it before we begin to redefine it? Jamal, did you have a, a, a thought about who you wanted to uh, start start off weighing in on that question? Well, this thought, for this particular question, I'd like for you to start off. Oh, you'd like for me to start off? Okay. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I think that I, I had the wonderful privilege of um, the New York Times providing me a platform for my written work this summer, and I wrote an article about Confederate monuments. Um, and I wrote that uh, an, a, a monument is a standing memory. It's an artifact that makes tangible the truth of the past. So, you know, in the context of my life and lived experience, my argument was that my body is a monument to the Confederacy insofar as the world needs one, um, because I am the descendant of uh, Confederate soldiers who 
uh, or Confederate officers who raped their slaves. Um, I am proof of who they were, what they did. I am a living artifact. I'm an artifact that makes tangible the truth of the past. My body is, my bones are, my blood, the color of my skin, it tells a story. Um, and so to me, that sort of the work um, a monument can do um, in its like most prof profound and um, the consequential calling or its most consequential uh, 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 effect, I guess. Um, but then I wanna, I wanna hear what my panelists have to say to build on that because I think that even as you, that still feels a bit abstract and it can go in a lot of different directions, so. Ibrahim. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, for, uh, everyone, for being here and for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful panel. It's very good to reunite with some of my favorite people in the world. <laughs> Um, yeah, so for me, I think that the idea of a monument, I've always addressed it in a very material sense in my work, because I very much rely on the idea of history and then uh, the residues of it as a starting point to really think about what the idea of anything that looks like a monument can be. For me, it can be anything. It can be from an archive to a piece of paper to an architecture. But for me, I think the most important thing is how we really understand it in relation to history. Uh, and secondly, also the potential that it has for maybe a certain promise for tomorrow. Um, um, I guess later on in the panel, we'll go into some of these things, but I have somehow tried in my own work to somehow address some monuments which somehow addressed maybe a certain colonial legacy. Uh, from the railways to physical monuments like this project that we did in uh, Antwerp uh, in 2018 uh, with Antonia Lampi and to uh, currently working on um, an, an, an old historical building which was built by the Eastern Bloc in Ghana in the 60s uh, towards economic emancipation in relation to the history that we had, we inherited throughout the, the colonial era. So when you think about monument for me, I think that is such a complex subject Sometimes, um, of course, like following the news in America, sometimes when you see during the lockdown and with uh, uh, George Floyd and all that, I saw all these uh, toppling down of, uh, of statues and all that. But I think that it's, uh, it goes, it, there has to be a step beyond what those, uh, what those gestures actually signify within the period that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to understand the implications of what this, Thing is that monuments and the ideological implications it comes with. Thank you. Bonaventure. So greetings to you all. And um, also from, from me, many thanks, um, especially to my dear sisters, Magda and Marina and um, yes, my brother Ibrahim and Jamal, and my sister Caroline. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, now I'm not a specialist on monuments, you know, so it's rather strange that I'm in this context. But uh, since I was invited to this party, I will say something. Um, you know, monuments are mnemonic tools. You know, they aid us in remembering, you know, they keep memory alive. Um, but it's also very important to say that monuments are meant to be hyperlived. They're meant to be things, uh, subjects that surpass life itself. They have to go beyond something that was experienced within a particular time, space, continuum. So monuments um, are often reduced to certain objects that we find out there. And I really like listening, actually reading Caroline's uh, text uh, in the summer about uh, the body as the monument which um, really echoes a lot with 
my practice, you know, reading through Asia by Irobi's The Body as a Site of Discourse. If the body is a site of discourse, then the body is definitely a monument. But I'll even take it further uh, to think about uh, monuments that are intangible. We tend to reduce the monuments to physical object, you know, and uh, in this slide, I would like to think about the work that Amadou, Amadou Ambateba did when he was invited to propose, uh, you know, heritage to the UNESCO. And he, he, he fought so much to propose oral cultures as, uh, you know, intangible heritage. And I think that we need to think about intangible monuments, you know, so we need to really shift from that notion of the monument just as an object. So I've been thinking about that. And I think that very much ties in with the work of Olu Bibi. So besides the object that is created, is the idea that becomes the mnemonic tool. So um, that is uh, my first contribution. Thank you. And, I, and, and thank you. I, I think you all touched on some really interesting and relevant points. The idea of using as the body, as the, the, the monument, the idea of memory and thinking about these and in, the intangibles that make a monument. And even pointing back to what Magda talked about earlier when she was talking about the Fisk, you know, Fisk University Jubilee Singers, those that, that gesture of, 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 or that tradition that is still passed on can serve as a monument. And so, in, in, and since now that we've framed this idea of what a monument is, or we have attempted to frame it, I'm going to talk about the building that I'm in every day, and then I'm going to propose a question to Ibrahim. And so, the building that I'm in is the Carl Van Vechten Art Gallery. Um, it has a beautiful history, uh, but it started in 1888. And so, with that, Du Bois. Uh, organized the class of 1888 to, uh, to build this building that then became the first gymnasium on HBCU campus. He believed that we should be both mentally and physically fit. And then in 1949, Georgia O'Keeffe uh, selected that building to become the first permanent art gallery on campus. And so in thinking about this building's history, and it's still a gallery today, but in thinking about this building's history, you know, one, and tracing its lineage back to Du Bois, and the contributions of the voice as a sociologist, as an activist, as so many different things. And then thinking about what we do as a curator, what we do as an artist and how we display material of cultural production. For me, that building itself feels as if it is a living monument. And so thinking about these living monuments or these structures, I wanna propose, I would like for Ibrahim to talk about the project that he's currently working on in Tamale. You're on mute, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so no, thank you very much uh, for that. I think, yeah. So yeah, I guess we've been having this conversation uh, in the past couple of months. Yeah. And uh, for me, I've been trying to really understand what it means as an artist to be able to produce. Bonaventure made a very important uh, point about not just the physicality of the object, but also with regards to what it comes with, both the conceptual aspect and also just the ideological value that it carries with it. Because sometimes that is also something that is as, though it's not something tangible that you can touch, but it also has a very important uh, effect on how it shapes things within the real world that we find ourselves in. So uh, the kind project I'm working on in Tamale is basically this uh, 19, uh, building that was built in the 1960s uh, by the by architects from the Eastern Bloc. So basically, uh, Russia, former Yugoslavia, Poland, but this building was abandoned in 1966 when Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown. I know as in relation to the, the, the colonial enterprise, which regards to the British building the railway to extract uh, commodities, um, Nkrumah's idea and agenda through the Pan-Africanist movement was somehow to invest into infrastructure, which was somehow supposed to intervene within uh, turning around the destiny of like the continent with regards to economics and all that. But these buildings were in relation to that. So of course, 
the idea was to mobilize labor in order to construct these spaces. And of course, once these spaces, they started constructing these spaces, they were at very different uh, geographical locations across the country. So uh, imagine 10 of the same buildings being built across different areas where they're growing cashew, cocoa, cotton, or whatever. And these buildings are supposed to be vessels to contain them, but they are very beautiful also. When you see them, it almost looks like they are these kinds of monuments, maybe within the Eastern Bloc or something. Um, so they, 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 these buildings, when they were abandoned in 1966, they were abandoned at very different stages. And as an artist, I've been asking myself questions regarding what the history of these spaces are and what they can propose for re-envisioning the future in relation to their physical structure and also uh, it, in terms of uh, spiking new imaginations. So I, uh, I during the lockdown period, the government made a proposal to sell off one of those spaces and it happened to be in my city. So I actually proposed um, using both uh, the, the, re the institutions that I uh, created both last year, SCCA, Tamale and Red Clay, as a proposal to convince the government that we could somehow inherit this building and return it into like a public institution and make it in, like turn it into a public trust. So they agreed. So in acquiring this space, now the work was to somehow literally excavate the space. And during the excavation period, we realized that there were so many like other life forms that were already, that had inhabited the buildings because 54 years um, since it was abandoned, uh, no one has literally seen what is underneath it. And many people had different ideas about what was there. As some people thought it was actually built as a nuclear shelter, a, poly, a, a detention center. Of course, when the coup happened with Nkrumah in 1966, there was a lot of propaganda that was created somehow to prevent any successive government from even touching that. And it worked. 54 years down the line, no one touches most of these uh, spaces. So now the idea is, how can we use the life forms, or as I turn to think about them, the ghosts which have somehow embodied these space as a new starting point to rethink about how the architecture can expand. Because in my work, I'm looking at uh, employing airplanes and trains as spaces which can somehow reignite the imagination among a new generation. These things you can consider physically as uh, some kind of failed, monuments or objects, but in another context, in another sense, way of reconfiguring the imagination. So now I'm thinking that maybe almost like a void of potential, it's almost as if when a star collapses and then it becomes a black hole and then through that black hole, maybe it can give us maybe another point of entry into another maybe galaxy or another universe that somehow gives us an alternative reality or looking of looking at things. So for me, I'm just trying as much as possible as an artist now to understand the place of architecture, objects, uh, both in a material sense and secondly, also purely from an ideological perspective. Because Trump is only able to do what he's doing because of the ideological conflicts that we have within America and also within the world at now, with given the people in, in the, on the right and people on the left. Sometimes I don't even understand what that means. But I think that is very important for us somehow to be able to readdress some of these things. And it already we're already living in a world which provides some of these answers. It's just as, as artists, we somehow uh, can be able to take time and pause and look at things, break them down and use them as the portals to somehow re-understand uh, the world that we find ourselves in. Ibrahim, I want to take a moment to see if we can, is it okay if we play a, the, a, a short video of the project in Tamale? Yeah, you can, uh, if, you, if you can. Okay. Megan, let's, let's play just a clip. And can you walk us through just a little bit of, uh, just a, of what's going on? <laughs> So this is literally um, uh, uh, my collaborators in Tamale, who are young men who mostly just sit around the building. 
for years and years, either just smoking or just having conversations, uh, working with them to somehow excavate the space. All of this space that you're seeing hasn't been occupied for the last 54 years. So you can see glimpses of like bats and other things, other organisms like snails, snakes, rep, uh, uh, monitor lizards, owls living within the space. Yeah, so that uh, the basic idea was somehow to, yeah, to, yeah, to reconfigure the space. Yeah, to clean it and to reorder the the life forms and to find out ways in which we could allow the architecture to, uh, to yeah, to expand the life forms within the space itself. So shifting away from the human and somehow making room for maybe all the other life forms that have been inhabited the building in the last uh, 60 years. Thank you. I think it's important because we are struggling so much to, to understand what human life is all about. Because each time we watch the news uh, from America, let's just talk about America. Uh, each time we, we watch the rest of the world, I think it's a bit of But each time we, we watch the news uh, from America, it's always so heartbreaking to really understand how we would use human life to, you know, and sometimes this sheer position of someone by his uh, economic standard somehow already makes it, somehow makes them inhuman or subhuman. So for me, I think that one of the questions I'm trying to ask is how can we also pay attention to other life forms? And it somehow allows us to see the value of what human life is and, um, how we are supposed to safeguard and protect it even a lot further. But maybe by through ecological means, like trying to protect the world, the ecology, looking at issues regarding climate and all that, we can somehow appreciate human life a lot more and um, address it as it's supposed to be. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Megan, we can stop the video just for a second. And I'm going to kind of shift to because we're thinking about life forms, mm -hmm. we're thinking about the body and uh, and the use of the body. So I'm going to shift back to Caroline. Um, and really, I want you to talk a little bit more about uh, one the essay that you wrote, but really thinking about the 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 your body or your skin tone as a monument. Um, if you could if you could go into a little bit more detail about that. I would love to. Thank you, Jamal. Um, and I'm so grateful to Abraham and Bonaventure for sharing this space with me and for giving me so much to think about. I've been, I'm such ever the student and professor. I've been taking pages of notes listening to them talk right now. Um, uh, a question that has come to me listening to both of them talk is about, you know, we have the notion of an intangible monument on the one hand, but then we also have I think separately to me, this question of what a monument is versus what a monument is meant to do, right? And I think that that is, um, and that sort of sends me back into this question, especially in the American South of, you know, a Confederate monument um, erected by say the Daughters of the Confederacy in 1930 in a town square in Alabama or Georgia or Mississippi or Tennessee or Arkansas versus say my body, which is actually a product of, um, of the Confederacy. You know, my grandfather's grandfather was actually a Confederate general. That's in my body, it's in my blood, right? Edmund Pettus, who, for whom the Edmund Pettus Bridge was named that, you know, that John Lewis marched over for, uh, you know, fighting for suffrage. Um, to me, my body is a living, Testament is a tangible artifact of Edmund Pettus's um, Edmund Pettus's life. I am big, I am a Confederate monument in that way, right? I am a tangible, I am a tangible, identifiable. I'm not even an intangible Bonaventure, right? I'm a physical living testament that is past just the immediate the immediacy of the moment too, right? But then I think about 
you know, those monuments that are made of wood and stone in these town squares, which are sort of more of the traditional form of a monument. And what they are, though, is not really a testament to the past. They are, they were erected um, as weapons of intimidation in the present and as a, um, a warning for the future of people who were wanting to claim the freedom that the Emancipation Proclamation technically granted them, right? And so I think that, you know, a monument as a weapon of oppression versus a monument as a way of acknowledging the history of the past. I'm really thinking about that divide a lot lately. And it's interesting to me, I wrote down, Ibrahim, while you were talking, you know, I said, well, does a building become a monument if it's left empty for 50 or 60 years? Right? Does it, you know, at what point does something become a monument because it's left as something that existed in the past that hasn't had a live a bit hasn't had an ongoing life? And I think that maybe it does become a monument by virtue of it saving, preserving in that like a capsule of that moment. And then, you know, when you send those guys and it's really moving watching them um, interact with that space because you've taken the nature, the like sort of social ecosystem that came up around the building and brought it into the building where you revealed that like nature will always come back into space. You know, when you're talking about the lizards, the snail, the owls, and you're going, you know, even in this like starkly industrial space that you were dealing with and sort of excavating, you know, we have the natural habitat coming into the space. You have the people and community that sort of learn to navigate the space um, with the building as it was re-entering it. And then, and I think that I'm just trying to put together in light of that, you know, you know, all of our work of, I wrote in my piece that the, um, my big point of contention with people who say that say taking down a Confederate monument is erasing the past or re-examining a Confederate monument is erasing the past, or renaming something for a Black person from that time is erasing the past. My big point of contention with that is that, um, I mean, there are so many <laughs> ideological ones, but you know, to me, it's not really a question of erasing the past or rewriting the past, but reframing it. Um, and I don't see why there's, I'd, and so to me, my question becomes, well, what exactly are we trying to remember? If we put up a monument in order to remember something, what exactly are we trying to remember? And why is it wrong to demand that we remember the more complete picture? Why is it wrong to demand that we remember the sins of the people who, you know, who were uh, embodied in those physical monuments? Why is it wrong to replace that monument with somebody else who was alive during that time who was fighting for their life on the right side of history? I mean, I think the answer is it's not wrong. And that's when we come back to this question of what a monument is versus what a monument is meant to do, right? And so I think that, um, you know, and then when we, when we start to examine why we're upset with trying to reframe the past or put up monuments that represent a more complete or righteous or right-minded picture, we're confronted with the fact that what we really want from those monuments, especially, or what, what American Southerners want from those monuments is um, security in their sense of white supremacy <laughs> um, moving forward, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's very simple. Um, and I think that they, and they want the intimidation and the efficacy that those, the, the monuments as a reminder, not of the men who live, but a reminder of um, how to keep people in their place. So I think, you know, and then I think about my body, my skin color, my skin is a reminder of what those men were. My, my body is a reminder that the, to the degree that my hair isn't like, you know, I used to be so jealous of my cousins who had, um, whose hair could take braids and things like that. Cause I had these weak, looser curls that had a certain um, genetic inheritance to them that I, oft I regretted um, growing up. And I think about that and I think, my hair, my light skin, those are testaments to what kind of men these people were. And that isn't something that um, needs to be put in stone or wood. That's something I'll live with and navigate, but, it, um, but it's to the degree you want to remember it, you remember it that way. And then you put those statues in museums like the Germans have done, you know, like we don't need gobbles and 
Hitler and, you know, all of the terrifying, they, those, the statues of Nazis don't exist in public spaces in Germany in the way that the statues of Confederates exist in this country. Um, I think that they require context because they're not monuments, they're statues, I think, maybe is the actual answer. Talked in a circle, but you guys have oh, inspired I mean, it, me. <laughs> it was perfect, it was beautiful. I think it's a perfect segue into Bonaventure. Um, and he, in a in a recent interview, he talked about how we cannot forget the extreme violence of the colonial enterprise, or he said it cannot be forgotten. And so, in thinking about how we as thinkers, how we as artists, how we are poets, can you kind of Bonaventure? Can you talk about how artists are responding, or how we're attempting to, or curators responding, and how we're attempting to dismantle these notions, or reflect? or recast these notions? Mm. Yeah, good question. And, and yeah, thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Ibrahim. Um, also many statements that I would have to chew on later. <laughs> now, I would like to say that um, I think monuments become monuments based on the fact that one inscribes that meaning to them. <laughs> so if we give too much agency to some people to define what a monument is, then that is what we remember. Because if we go back to the etymology of the word monument, monere, that, to, that which reminds, we understand that you can always define what a monument is to you. Why am I saying this? I think I would also like very much to shift from, because the notion of the monument has become also something very phallic. You know, the monument as the erection you know, that which is erected to become the monument. I think there's, a, there's something extremely perverse about that. But the monument is actually omnipresent. You know, it is left upon us. And I think that is what some artists do that I find extremely important, that they choose that which is the monument. Okay, so if we take the work of somebody like Otobon Kanga, and I remember a show she did in the Porticus in Frankfurt a couple of years back, and there was one work in there based on a travel she had made to Namibia. And in Namibia, she had documented oh, um, the, the craters, you know, the kind of lakes that were left over after the violent exploitation of the Germans, of the British, and all the other people that passed through that space, that excavated and left these spaces, you know. And the question was then, what is the monument? Does one need to come there and erect another mon monument of this history? No. Those holes are the monuments. The monument as the concave, not the convex. That which goes inside and not necessarily that which gets outside, you know. And I think that is important. I think an artist like Wutubon Kanga does that brilliantly. But there are many more. Um, one can think, again, coming back to Olu Gribe, you know, I think the most important thing in the work he did for Documenta 14, uh, the obelisk, in my opinion, wasn't necessarily the obelisk, but it was the statement he made. I was a stranger and you took me in. That to me is the monument. That is to me the, 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 the mnemonic, the mnemonic tool, you know, that helps me to remember something, you know, and picking it from the Bible, you know, reminding the people in this society that claim to be a Christian culture that this is it, this is what you claim. This is it in your face, you know? And I think that is important. Now, um, 
there are many ways to look at it, you know, and uh, though I'm not a scholar of monuments, <laughs> um, I, I have written in the past, you know, on a couple of things. You know, one um, article that I published uh, in Marina Fukidis' uh, South as a State of Mind, uh, which was about um, the so-called objects that have been taken from the African continent or from the rest of the world and locked up in ethnographic museums in the West. Now, a lot of them are monuments. They are monuments. <laughs> you know, because before the British came in into um, the, the palace of the Uba of Benin, you know, the guild for everything that happens, you know, knowledge or the history is inscribed in some of these so-called Benin bronzes. And many of them were taken away and locked up in these spaces. So that monument is also locked up there. Now, um, so one could look at that, one could concentrate and, and work on that and a couple of artists are doing that. But I would really like to make a shift that, uh, and I think I mentioned that in the first part of it, you know, a shift towards performativity, you know. And in looking at uh, Ibrahim Ahama's work, so that building is, of course, you can declare it a monument, <laughs> but there's something about those bodies working in that space, carrying certain histories, performing certain things, that I find very important. And I'm coming back to Isiaba Yerobi, you know, again, whose work I got to know, by the way, through Olubibe. You know, and in this paper, you know, the philosophy of the sea, in which he writes about how could Africans be, African people, you know, keep the knowledge with them despite the violence that was exerted on them. And this brings me back to, to Caroline's statement, because he said, through the body, through the rituals, through the performativity, you know, and I find this extremely important, you know, the performance of knowledge, the performance of that which is to be remembered, you know. Now, of course, we could take it through to sonicity, you know, to the sonoros, through singing, through music, through the voice, and listening to Magdalena Campos Pons, the voice, her voice, what it carries, you know, that is the monument. That was a full stop. Thank you. Thank you. you. You raised some really important points and I'm, you've got me motivated and excited about uh, what's to come. But I would like to turn it over to either Caroline or Ibrahim to really just have a conversation to see if ways that which we can respond to continue the conversation. Otherwise, I if think, you point another example, if you if you don't mind, Ibrahim, yeah. do you have some, some? Okay, just go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Please, just after you. Because uh, I've been thinking about the work of Kilwanji Kiahenda, another yes. brother, you know, another brilliant artist, you know, who did a work called uh, Omen Novo, and Omen Novo is a piece he did in 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 Luanda, you know. So after the war. Um, now, this is very interesting because, uh, you know, the so-called, the, the monuments, the, the statues of the politicians of that were torn down, you know. So there was a period in Luanda where you had pedestals. You could go around the city. You had tens of pedestals and more empty. <laughs> so what is that? What, what, what are we supposed to remember? And I think this is brilliant. He just did a, another work mm -hmm. on... Again, similar concept, you know, on billboards, you know, after the economic crisis, the crash of the oil in, in, in Angola. So, so those spaces that were created to become the monuments of capitalism are now empty. What happens there? 
and I find that extremely brilliant, you know. And for in the work Omen uh, Omen Novo, uh, Kiruanji invited other artists, people around, you know, to do this one minute statue. So the people went on the pedestals and performed being a monument, standing there with a book in the hand, with whatever, you know, performing that. And I thought that was incredibly strong, incredibly important, you know. I think it's really important. There were some, there was a point that uh, Borna raised regarding like um, looking into like the labor forms and all that, and specifically also with regards to like uh, Autobahn's work and the idea of dealing with like the, the negative space. Yeah. And I think for me, it's something that I've somehow also been looking at in different ways. Um, like um, there is, a, I'll use an example. There is an old man in the, in the North where I come from. He's about uh, maybe 80 something. He will not be happy if I say he's an old man, but <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, he's been interested for many years in these kind of archaeological excavations because uh, for, with Ghana, like the old Ghana and Sunga empire, when there was a lot of migration in the, yeah, from let's say even from like the uh, 10th century to like the, maybe the 14th, there were traces of like, let's say uh, communities, uh, uh, cult uh, cultures that were left in places which in time uh, was covered or, or were either abandoned graveyards and many different uh, things. And uh, he is, he's, he turned himself into a custodian, actually traveling across these different sites because each time there is, let's say, uh, a major construction or there is a, like a big farming activity like uh, that happens, they always excavate or come across these uh, big uh, gra a graveyard of like, um, archaeological objects, but somehow they are either um, they are either destroyed or they end up on a black market that end up in museums around the world. So he's somehow committed his life into uh, the preservation of some of these uh, findings. And I thought it was really interesting with regards to, because if, um, if we're trying to really understand the kind of uh, history that we've inherited or where we are coming from, because mostly within contemporary society and culture, even with regards to the idea of the memory, it's very much selected. So he, as a person, is somehow trying to maybe uh, access space and time through a very different means. And I thought that it was also interesting with our history in Ghana, with regards to a lot of like the post-independence architecture or even before independence architecture that was abandoned that we don't even think about within our curriculum. So as an artist, how do you somehow bring uh, these uh, different things together? So for instance, how does it work to be able to um, um, uh, insert, let's say, uh, an archeological objects from the same land, which maybe comes from maybe like the fifth century to a building that was built in the post independence era when the world was torn between the idea of uh, freedom through the non-alliance movement with countries like Ghana, Cuba, and many other countries, or the West that was somehow also very much uh, dwelling on the, the legacy of, let's say, the colonial enterprise and also what capital had become. So I think that within that, uh, within that sense, the idea of the monument becomes really important as Bonaventure is talking about, like how do we really uh, look at the importance of uh, some of these gestures and what it implies with regards to, um, um, yeah, somehow given significance or priority to uh, these uh, things. Caroline. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> what a, this is so exciting. And, and I'm selfishly going to say I'm working on a book proposal right now and I've mm. got, so I really, I think I've got some new, um, governing you know notions for how I'm going to frame a section that I was really stuck with I was like sort of and I'm going to talk about that so one I'm obsessed I wrote down we cannot forget the extreme violence of the colonial enterprise um, I love that sentence um, and I'm thinking about you know what we do with the artifacts of the 
pre-colonial past together with the um, sort of strange wasteland of the post-colonial hands off. And then, you know, and then the, and then the desire for new things to come from that. And I think that, you know, the idea of a monument being a matter of perspective, right? A matter of who's looking at it and who's trying to remember what um, has been uh, clarified for me. And I think, you know, and I'm sort of thinking to myself, well, so they're not actually monuments, they're statues until I, you know, they're, to me, that's a statue, not a monument, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm the monument, that's a statue, right? I'm the vessel, I am a concave, right? I mean, even just like, just the, by virtue of my womanness, but then beyond everything, you know, like the question of my monumenthood is a feminine one. That's a luxury of mine, I would say. <laughs> um, but I also think it makes me think about this notion of and I said it a little bit before, but the question of a monument as a weapon, when we think about what monuments are meant to do. But then I think that those holes on the landscape become a weapon, right? You know, like we have monuments on both sides. I mean, I think that that to me, I don't, I think it might just be the, the so sort of social cultural climate that I'm, that we're all living in really. But I think I feel very much always at war I sat, I sat on a panel yesterday where a black American woman said, well, it's always been a pandemic for us. I feel like it's always been a war. Um, and I think that looking at the monuments, the so-called Confederate monuments as statues that they call monuments to weaponize them against us, it makes me think about what our monuments are and how we can use them as, um, as weapons of opposition. <laughs> Right. And I think that that to me is and, you know, and I was thinking about even the statement of, you know, throwing the Bible back in the face of the oppressor. The So, you know, that I was a stranger and you let me in, but not right. Like, I think that the idea of repurposing, reframing and then allowing our monuments to do um, active um, agent agency filled urgent work on our own behalf toward an end of um, like further liberation is um, an exciting uh, reframe for my mind about what a monument can do. It's not just a tearing down of the old ones, um, but a understanding um, that the old ones aren't even monuments unless I a, a consent to there being monuments and that I can withdraw my consent and then erect or, you know, consecrate my own. Um, I think that that's really uh, an exciting turn for me um, in terms of thinking about how to frame it in light of you know, y'all's uh, insights. So thank you. <laughs> hey, Carolyn, listening to you, I had to think of um, the work of a Cameroonian activist, you know, um, one could call him an artist as well. I don't really know how. Maybe one doesn't need a category for him. He's called uh, Andre Blesse Sama. He became very, he's very well known in Cameroon, Andre Blesse Sama, because he goes around the country, especially in Douala, sometimes in Yaoundé, and he would do it almost single-handedly. He would tear down uh, <laughs> the statues. You know, so because see, you go to Cameroon, you find, you know, the statues of uh, Charles de Gaulle and all this, all this, you know, these people that have never wanted anything good for African people, never. But they're there. So, so the, the politics of memory becomes very important in thinking about monuments, the politics of memory. What do we choose to remember? Now, this guy spends a fair share of his life in jail because whenever he tears down uh, a statue, say, of the Gaulle or the Plague, or one of these, or any, any of these colonialists, he's locked up. And he's not locked up by the French. He's locked up by Cameroonian uh, police officers and innocent, the violence of the state itself. Now, so once upon a time, he put up a statue of a guy, a Cameroonian politician, 
you know, who was important during the independence era, John Goo Foncher. And that statue stayed for uh, a few hours and it was taken down by the police. <laughs> so he chose to remember a Cameroonian that one could say, well, this is part of our history and the authority in place tore it down. <laughs> But when he pulls down the statue of a colonialist, he's taken to jail. So, so the politics of memory is at the core of you know thinking about monuments. You know, so maybe that is when we have to differentiate between monumentality and monument. You know, yeah. So and so on and so forth. I okay. totally agree with Bona. I think one last thing I would like to add is um, I'll briefly mention the project that I did with um, uh, Bonnet's uh, colleague from uh, Savi, uh, Antonia Lampi. In 2018, there was a project we did in Antwerp called uh, titled uh, on Mon Mon Monumental Silences, which was literally taking uh, a mod like a, 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 now that we're discussing monuments and statues, maybe I should call it a statue, as Caroline said. <laughs> so <laughs> taking this old statue, which was in Antwerp, and then it's a statue of uh, an old, uh, like um, a Belgian priest with a so-called Congolese savage at his knees. And it's in the public space, you know? So sometimes when there are these questions about what, what kind of statues have the right to be in the public square and if it's in the public square does it really mean that it represents our collective history and it, by being in the public square it means that we uh, legitimize what that history is without any sense of context because sometimes when there's a context to it it's different like if some of if there was a context to some of these confederate monuments saying that Ibrahim. oh this was a person who uh, who killed uh, 500,000 people, blah, blah, blah. Then at least it becomes, there's something also pedagogical about it in a way that the memory, it reactivates our memory in a different sense. So for us, uh, with my uh, 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 collaborator and I, Antonia, one of the things that we decided to do within with this project was to take this monument off the pedestal and to uh, make a copy of it, but in rubber. So, because rubber was the material that led to the genocide in Congo. So somehow attaching, by bringing in rubber in the same image, you are somehow the, the memory of what that, uh, what of the, of the Belgian and Congo came into being. So when you look at the statue or this uh, new monument, you cannot look at it very innocently. You cannot look at it and say, oh, it's just uh, a, a, Congo, um, a, a priest and then a, a man uh, re, uh, somehow trying to redeem some sense of salvation at his knees or whatever. It brings into the, the bare realities of the brutal history that this uh, statue somehow connotes. So the idea of the memory is very important. And I think uh, materiality somehow sometimes can, uh, through the shift in material value, can already somehow allow us a new point of entry into looking at the same image which is in the world that uh, we haven't had, uh, we haven't been able to address in a certain way. Yeah, I, I, I was just thinking about it. I thought it was somehow okay. interesting. Thank you, Ibrahim. And, I, and yeah. that was something I wanted to bring up after, I mean, I want to show the image of that uh, sculpture uh, after we hear from the respondent. And I really want to thank all the panelists for such an inspiring conversation. And I wish that we had more time to continue to steal these ideas, but we're going to transition to hear from Jane Landers, who's been thinking about what we've been talking about and give her an opportunity to respond. And then we're going, we've been flooded with questions uh, from our audience, which I'm really excited about. And so then we, I would like to go to those, question, those questions from our audience, but I'm gonna turn it over to Jane first. Thank you, Jamal. And thank you to my Cuban sister, Magda, for including me in this wonderful group. It's been such a stimulating conversation and I found so many things that relate. I'm no artist. I'm an historian, and I think the reason uh, Magda included me is I am the U.S. representative of UNESCO's uh, scientific uh, committee on the slave route. And so I do travel the Americas uh, looking for memory, basically. And I was so pleased that we had a definition of 
monuments and memory uh, that was so engaging because we had discussions about saving archives and about paper, history, um, you know, who records it, how is it rewritten, what are the new narratives that we might uh, place around these uh, potentially, uh, you know, hostile and, and terrible monuments rather than tearing them down, perhaps doing something different with them as Carolyn suggested and several others. And uh, coincidentally, yesterday in the United States, a group uh, decided to have an action, day, a day of action around Civil War Confederate cemeteries. And so many historians went out with their placards and so on to do peaceful protests in these Confederate cemeteries. And that's one of the things we try to do as well as historians is uh, shift the narratives, rewrite the narratives. Uh, Carolyn's here in Nashville with me and everything in this city is represented as gone with the wind and uh, great plantation antebellum South and uh, you know illiterate slaves in a field somewhere. And if we go back further, as uh, Ibrahim was talking about rescuing the wonderful archeological materials, I work a lot with archeologists. I work with museum people to rewrite this narrative. Uh, even the spokesmen at the national parks uh, have to have a new narrative to give to the people that come to view these places. Um, they may want to come to view the things that Carolyn talked about, the oppressors and so on, and to glorify and keep that narrative going. We have to provide them with a different storyline. And so also you all uh, mentioned curriculum, I think earlier, that's a very important uh, thing to talk about. You may have heard our presidents talking about uh, his dislike for the 1619 project and for revising any kind of racial sensitivity programs. Uh, and he wants instead some kind of a patriotic curriculum. Well, no, we need to uh, revise the history by including all of the material that's been excised from it, erased from it. Um, and so I think this is something that archeologists can contribute to, historians can contribute to as well. And several of the projects that we have here in Nashville, we have a, a mapping project called Historic Black Nashville. And the students from my class uh, research the histories that are not on our maps and begin to place on them the black schools that were here before the Civil War, the black businesses, the black churches, the individuals of note. And that's a wonderful project I'm excited about. Uh, we also work with a very important um, physical space called Fort Negley that was a Civil War fort created by slaves who ran away from the plantation, built it, died there. They were about to put a hotel on it and by nominating it for a UNESCO nomination, I was able to stop that development. And now the community reenacts the battles there, plays the parts of the soldiers that we're starting to create the lives for. And we're even interviewing the descendants of those people who still live in Nashville. So that's another exciting project. And uh, finally, since I know we were running a little bit short here of time, uh, I run also here at Nashville in Vanderbilt, something called the Slave Society's Digital Archive. So to respond to Bonaventure and Ibrahim's uh, talk about, uh, yes, here we are, uh, talk about paper and archives can also be memory and memorialize people who have not been in the past. This is our project and some of my wonderful grad students. And we go around to all the places that we can get access, uh, Cuba, Brazil, Florida, Colombia, Cape Verde, uh, we have also documents from baptismal documents from Luanda that you mentioned the other day. These are from Cuba. Uh, so Magda and I've talked a lot about these. There's some art in it. Um, and in these documents, which don't appear in English language documents, are very specific references to the ethnicity of the people who uh, are being baptized, married, confirmed, or buried, uh, to whether or not they are enslaved or free, we're linking them to their godparent networks, to their family networks, to where they live and so on. So um, this is a project that is a training project as well to start to train young historians in all the other places we work 
about how to uh, preserve their history, how to uh, make it accessible to everybody. It's a way of democratizing the knowledge. It's so hard one. It takes a lot of effort to go to some of these places and work there for a long time, finding records and documenting them, bringing them to the, the Vanderbilt system, which everybody can access for free, and training those students to uh, do the work themselves once we leave. And it's the same model now that we're using in the Historic Black Nashville class. And we always go to Jamal's wonderful special collections there where Delisa Harris, the librarian helps us uh, document the history of Nashville. We take the students to archives and train them to be historians as well. So I think many, many connections between what you wonderful artists and authors are doing and what historians are also trying to do to change uh, you know, perceptions, public understanding of these places, of the objects and so on. And I am really compelled by the urgency of our effort to slave, uh, save these papers because some that I worked on in Cuba many years ago are no longer even there. The resources, the economic disparities in some of the countries I work in this are so enormous that they cannot uh, take on that effort. It's too expensive and so on, but we can help and leave all the materials there and leave all the training there and also share it with everybody so that um, we're, we're trying to revise history in that way. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you, Jane. I, I really enjoyed that. And also I really appreciate you bringing up Fisk University Special Collections. Um, it's a, it, it was uh, set up or, or Arturo Schomburg who ended up donating his or selling his collection to the, to the New York Library System to become the Schomburg Library, helped set up our special collections, I think in 1933 before he, before he did I didn't that. realize that, but yeah. I've worked at, in the New York Public Library on those collections, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's an amazing repository of literature and writings and images that have been produced throughout the diaspora. But before, before we talk about that, I do wanna go back to, uh, cause I think what Ibrahim was talking about earlier is the really the importance of context. And so I think it's really important before we go to our, our next question to show that slide. Megan, can you pull up that slide of that work? Let's see if we can get it up. But we'll come back to it. I'll give it a, a few more seconds. I do think it's important to share that. Jamal, while we're waiting, can I just say another uh, thing that we've been able to save is uh, when Ouida was blown up in the revolutionary era, uh, the fort that had all the baptisms at that point also was lost. But Pierre Verger, the famous anthropologist of Africa and Brazil had hand copied all of those, and we were we were gifted those when we went to uh, Wida to try to do some research and, and preservation work. So that's now also up on the on the website. Well, what's being shown right now is Ulua Guibes. We may come back to that because I, I do want to make sure that we answer our audience questions. And so one question is is how, uh, how can we define and shape monuments as vessels of togetherness on their own behalf and place for discussing ways to bring the war down as instead of feeding into the conflict? And that's open to all the panelists. Jamal, can you repeat the second half of that question, please? Uh-huh. It is on their own, well, uh, how can we redefine and shape monuments as vessel, vessels of togetherness on their own behalf and places for discussing ways to bringing the war down as instead of feeding the conflict? And so I guess in a sense, the, 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 they're asking us, how can we, how can, how, how can we build monuments that represent people coming together as opposed to feeding into this in, into conflict. Can I start with that one? I'm as I'm already unmuted anyway. Hi, thanks yeah. guys. Um, I'm you know in both of the classes that I'm teaching this semester at Vanderbilt, my 
most urgent um, theme that I'm trying to underscore to my students, and I think um, I really am realizing that it just applies everywhere, is we've got to, in order to do that, we have to first establish some kind of what I um, consensual reality. Do you know? Like, and by consensual reality, we have to all agree on the facts of what happened um, and the necessity that they be represented factually. Um, you know, we all have to agree that one plus one equals two. We don't have to all agree about how we feel about that, <laughs> but we all have to agree um, that we've used the right formula, that the, uh, that the outcome is the same, is the, uh, agreed upon and understood and sort of immutable and controvertible. Um, and then we can build monuments that, uh, that unite us because we understand what we're holding up um, or what we're trying to remember. Uh, I think consensual reality, achieving consensual reality first is my short answer to that question. As opposed to alternative facts? Quite right. <laughs> or, or, or history with a um, a perspective, like which, which, which paper did you read? Which numbers do you have? It's like, we just need some sort of consensual reality. It's like, right, more white people have died of COVID in America than people of color. But that number is only one piece of the reality of like percentages of people who have died, right? So it's a question of uh, consensual reality about what we, what information is required to make a decision, right? I think that that's the yeah. Marvin Ventura. Um, I honestly don't know if I can answer the question because <clears throat> I don't know, you know, honestly, I don't know. I don't know because before I start worrying too much about telling everybody's story, I need to tell my own story. You know, um, it's like we have to rush, you know, we have to go too fast, you know, and then we get into kind of a generalization where, okay, I'm obliged to think about a monument that covers everyone. Of course, you know, we do that. But let me have the space to tell my own stories. Now, um, as, as uh, Jane was showing the images and I was thinking, you know, it is very interesting because, I mean, it's a work is an important work, no doubt. Uh, but those forts, those churches, they also those spaces of violence, you know, that continuously get, you know, repeated there's a certain violence that gets reenacted within that repetition and so on and so forth, you know. And I think, I'm thinking of Ibrahim Mahama's work here, you know, with the, the many years of enveloping some of such spaces, you know, with the youth sacks, you know, mm -hmm. you know, enveloping them, giving them a new narrative, telling, you know, superimposing other stories upon them, maybe also containing them. I'm thinking about that, but I'm also thinking about other spaces, you know, because if you think of the work of Abdiazo Nascimento in Brazil, for example, and Abdiazo Nascimento wrote this very important book, o o Quilombismo, you know, thinking about the Quilombos, you know, thinking about this very important space when uh, the the some of the enslaved people fought for their freedoms, went out, created such spaces. And you remember, I've just done as meant to say, these were the first democratic spaces in that part of the world. So we need to, in, to, to think about these things, you know, think about the spaces. So to me, if I start narrating, I would like to speak from that space of the Quilombo, the so-called space of the Maroon, rather than, rather than these churches. 
you know, but it's a choice, you know, Every, everybody, you know, we're free, there's space for everybody, you know, but I also don't want to be forced into, you know, creating fictions of like, okay, we have to, you know, kumbaya and so on. No, I need to tell my story. It's fine. Everybody tell the story and then we'll get there someday where we can all then, you know, at the end of the day, if the Quilombo is the first piece of democracy, then it's all our story then, you know? But I think that, you know, part of the process of unlearning, you know, you know which uh, Spivak talks about, you know, unlearning and losing your privilege is also recognizing that you're short of knowledge. <laughs> so in looking at the Quilombo as that space of knowledge, that first democracy within that space, one actually learns much more. Therefore, it is a history for all of us. May I respond there? That's actually, uh, Bonaventure, my, my specialty. I work on maroon communities uh, in Brazil and Colombia and, Cuba, and Florida and the Seminole, Black Seminoles. So it's my specialty. Mm. It's what I write about. And I do also recover those records whenever I can, material, mm. uh, documentary mm. records. And I actually begin with African kingdoms in the, mm. even, and so Palmares, for instance, the, the famous Quilombo in Brazil, they had mm. a monarchy, a hereditary monarchy. So did also my places in Mexico and mm. many others. And that's the first, version of it. The second, I actually found a Black Republic in Mexico that they constituted mm. in that political shape as Republic, mm. and free Black towns uh, that mm. are more on the municipal model run by their mm. own people and so on. So in the Spanish and Portuguese records in which I work, you're right, we get a much broader picture. Mm. The churches mm. collect only those uh, records for the Catholic faith. Uh, mm. I don't even work on except to mention that we are trying to preserve the one in Nashville. But I do yeah. think my specialty is Kilo. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Yes. So I'm going to jump in there. We have to transition in a moment. But I oh, do sorry. To, and and I, I'm sorry that we weren't able to show the, the work by Ibrahim. But what I will say is that we're working on an intervention that will happen later in the year uh, in Nashville, that Fisk. And also, he has a project that's opening up at the University of Michigan. Uh, Next week, is that correct? It's opening up? Yeah, but they're installing today. Yep, so the install starts today. But at this time, I want again to thank everybody for such an inspiring conversation. Um, and it's been such an honor to, to, to be able to moderate a panel with such critical and, and great thinkers. Um, but at this point, I want to bring Magda back to the conversation for a few words before we introduce the intervention that we have to show today. Well, I am I am uh, in awe as I usually do, and um, just listen to this conversation. I want just to say two things, uh, fundamental. Uh, EADJ is a curriculum. Uh, in the audience today, with all the other uh, invitees and colleagues, are the entire class of EADJ that host together a student from Vanderbilt, Fisk University, Harvard University. University of Riverside, California, and students observing from University of Havana. So uh, in this idea of um, moving to the global south and it, trying to structure in this amazing topics that we are uh, discussing today, the students are sitting in the audience. They are taking notes. They're going to respond. Uh, EADA is not only a platform for artists to discourse, but already is a, a academic platform from where new ideas and new projects would emanate. I am um, absolutely uh, overwhelmed with ideas and um, I want to thank uh, all the speakers, Marina Fokiris um, as program curator. Uh, and I want to just invite us before we see the intervention, the artist intervention that will be presented by Caroline to join us next Wednesday, October 7th for a, a starting the new topic, emerging solidarities. Uh, we know for this conversation that we could have five, six, seven more panels just in the issue of monuments. I just want to say uh, the impermanency of the monument is very much an idea in my mind 
as we move forward. I want to make that piece that Bonaventura mentioned of owning a place with the body performing monumentality. And thank you, you all for being with us this morning and please bring your friends and family and take this conversation to a discussion to your dinner table, to your water fountain. Be sure that the conversation don't end with us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Magda. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Megan. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for including me as the non-artist among you. <laughs> you are brilliant. <laughs> well, um, is this my, this is my moment? Is that, okay. So I hate, I honestly, I feel a little bit um, heartbroken to, not that I don't, I'm not excited about sharing this, but I kind of want to just scrap the whole rest of the plan and keep talking to my two new friends, <laughs> my, new, my three new friends on the screen. Jamal's my old friend. I've known him for a long time, but um, as we have a plan, I think what I will say about this project is um, what you're about to watch or what you're about to hear and experience is um, a, a fraction of a, um, a written and oral piece uh, by T-Bone Burnett, who is, if you don't know him, a, um, a recording artist, producer, sort of legendary guitar player in the world of American um, you know, music, rock and roll, all of the things. Um, and T-Bone approached me about writing an introduction for him and working together with him on some of what this project was to become. Uh, because I think that he's really trying to do uh, the real work of reckoning with his whiteness. And I say it in the introdu I say it in the introduction you're about to hear me perform, but I think it bears repeating that I came to the table to this project because I think um, the only people who can model a new way of being a better white person are white people who have gotten there. I can make demands, I can express my truth, but I can't model how to be a good white person to white people. <laughs> um, only good white people can do that. And I think that when we think about restorative justice, when we think about healing, when we think about truth and reconciliation, um, when we think about not having our statues taken down and our stories silenced, Bonaventure, like when we're saying, I'm not worried about that story, I'm worried about telling my story, but like, I wanna live to tell my story. I wanna be free after I've told my story. I want the, sto the art that I made that told my story to remain. And that requires allies, um, especially in the spaces where we live right now. And so to me, I think, you know, when I talk about, um, when I talk about uh, consensual reality, I think what I'm talking about is like getting to a place where when I tell my story, it remains standing and that it holds as truth um, and that it becomes part of the infrastructure of the space where I live. Um, and so to me, um, you know, T-Bone's commitment to figuring out how to do that in the American South, given his platform, given his privileges, given, um, you know, given where he comes from, um, I think that that to me feels uh, in this moment urgent and inspiring. Um, and so I felt... Uh, I felt called on to, you know, point out the rightness of that, um, of that, of that desire to find a way to be a on the right side of history, um, to make more space for the telling of these black and brown stories, because, um, like, you know, I, I want to be safe and be well and speak the truth. Um, and I just wanna, and really quick pivot. I just really am mind blown by the Andre Blase Asama story. And I think it fits right in because you think about how, you know, that's like profound, intense efficacy of the violence um, because it's in the erasure too. You know, black man takes down white statue, goes to jail. Jack black man puts up black statue, it gets taken down. I mean, it's canceling in every direction. Um, and there's an erasure to that that is so harrowing. So again, 
it requires like sane white people with power to decide that that kind of whiteness is wrong and say something too. Because otherwise, you know, because there are systems in place where we will wind up canceling ourselves out because of the effect, efficacy and violence and like of the, of the systems that have been left in place. And that to me is terrifying. So that said, um, please, I'm so excited to uh, introduce to you um, T-Bone Burnett's uh, project um, called the Confederacy Truth and Reconciliation. Or and my This is Caroline Randall Williams. Audible Originals presents The Confederacy Truth and Reconciliation. A words and music production written and performed by T Bone Burnett. T Bone Burnett lives truth to power. He lives being a witness. He was an early adopter of those best practices. But now, he is not just witnessing, not just listening. He's looking backward and calling out his histories. He's doing the essential work of using a position of privilege to question not just how we remember the past, but how the past did its dirty work in real time. As a black woman in the trenches on the right side of history, I can tell you that's the kind of ally we need right now. And then beyond all that, there's the scope and substance of his life, which are the stuff of recorded music legend. If you're listening to this, you know I'm not exaggerating. To hear him go through the work of right remembering is its own private gift. To watch him turn this chapter of his life's work toward calling for a reckoning with all the strength of his celebrated voice, well, that's a world gift of the highest order. This production is art, oral history, living artifact, and call to action all at once. It's the right kind of monument. This is a personal reflection on what is actual and what is fictional about white supremacy. I am a musician, a hillbilly guitar player. The only expertise I can allege for wading into these turbulent waters, and I might be out of my mind for doing so, is the knowledge I have gained by listening hard to music for 60 years. If you want to know the truth, the true history of a place or a people, then listen to the music that comes from there and them. Music doesn't lie. When I was a kid, I ran into some cognitive type dissonance around the things I was hearing about African Americans and the things I was hearing from African Americans. I could hear clearly that nobody was better than Ray Charles. Same for Aretha Franklin, same for Helen Wolf, same for Billie Holiday, same for Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald and Mahalia Jackson and Sarah Vaughan and Louis Armstrong and Charlie Parker. For that matter, same for Slim Harpo and Jimmy Reed and Big Mama Thornton and B.B. King and Laverne Baker and Chuck Berry. The list could go on for an hour. Not that I didn't love artists who weren't African Americans. I loved Jimmy Rogers and Hank Williams as much as I loved Skip James and Robert Johnson. It was that I kept hearing that African Americans were somehow inferior to what I will call, for the purposes of this essay, Anglo-Saxons, Caucasians, people who had come to America from Europe. And through all this time, I had this terrible sense that the Civil War had never ended that there was a ceasefire, but that the animosity, the hostilities never stopped. 
they only ebbed and flowed. Violence kept breaking out throughout my life, much of it around the same problem that had caused the Civil War. It was troubling, to say the least. So a couple of years ago, I started writing this recollection. I had no idea why I was writing it. I'm still not sure, but I suppose that I hope I will be able to circulate some of the knowledge I have gathered in the last 60-some-odd years, and that it will bring some clarity and some courage to someone. Everybody wants to know the truth, but nobody wants to hear it. Everybody has to face the end, but nobody wants to get near it. Everybody wants peace, but nobody wants to surrender. Everyone lives in the past. But nobody seems to remember There is nothing as long as never As everything burns it grows cold Everybody wants to live forever But nobody wants to get old Everybody wants to be forgiven, but nobody wants to confess. Everyone longs to hold on to a moment that no one can ever possess. Everyone wants to be free, but no one can pay the price. Everyone wants to be heard. When no one has asked for advice There is nothing as long as never As everything burns it grows cold Everybody wants to live forever But nobody wants to get old Nobody knows the end of the story We must wait for it to unfold Everyone lives facing momento mori Nobody wants to get old But nobody wants to get old 